Thanks, Richard, and thanks also to the organizers and especially uh, to David Gossett for bringing us all together. This is a really great conference, and I'm excited to be a part of it. Uh, as Richard said, I'm going to be talking about characterizing coherent errors efficiently, robustly, and simply. And this is joint work with the theory that I'm going to be talking about is joint with Ted Yoder, who is here somewhere, and Guang Hao um, and then the experimental results that I'll be showing uh, were in collaboration with Kenny Rudinger and other experimental folks at Sandia. And Robin Bloom Kahoot is maybe here from the Sandia crowd, maybe a couple other people as well. Okay, so I think it's a really exciting time to be in this field of quantum computing because we are just quickly being surrounded by these prototype quantum computers. Uh, well, because IBM is hosting us, I get to put a picture of their device on the cover slide, but there are lots of other companies and also academic groups that are building these devices that are on the cusp of doing new and exciting things. But I think the question that we're here to address is what are the challenges that face us in order to move beyond these prototypes and move towards quantum computers that can do novel things that classical computers can't do? And I really like Jay's kind of metaphor this morning that we sh need to think about this progress not just in one direction in the number of qubits, but kind of thinking about increasing our quantum volume in terms of having qubits that are not just, not just large systems, but also systems that ha are accurate and think about the many dimensions in which we can pr improve our quantum systems. So for me, the kind of access of this quantum volume that I'm the most interested in is how we can come up with good calibration techniques. So how we can improve the quantum systems that we already have and hopefully get below kind of the fault tolerant thresholds that we're, we'd like to eventually get below. Okay, so calibration is a really important procedure in building a quantum computer. Uh, calibration, basically what I mean by that is you need to be able to quickly and easily tune up hundreds or thousands of qubit gates uh, on the slide, I wrote mul potentially multiple times a day. Um, in some systems, you might have to do this calibration multiple times an hour. And just, I think even this morning, we had a demonstration of this. Jay was putting up that picture of his, the, the 20 qubit system that IBM is developing, but saying that, well, we're still in the process of calibrating this and benchmarking it. Like this process of calibration can really be an incredibly time consuming process. Um, so I'm really interested in how we can come up with better ways to calibrate quantum gates. Uh, so when I say tune up this calibration procedure, what, what I mean by that is we need to be able to detect and correct. In particular, what I'm interested in are control errors. So there, there are always going to be some errors that we cannot control in our system. That's why we have you know, fault tolerant quantum computing. We expect that there will always be errors that we can't deal with. But a lot of the errors that are occurring in our system are due to our own control, that we are you know, trying to uh, address these quantum systems and we're not doing it correctly. But if we could better address these systems, if we had more precise control, um, then we could improve our gates. So in this talk, I'm gonna be particularly interested in how do we detect what has gone wrong with our control? Because the, the detection is something that's kind of universal across many different types of devices. But once you've figured out what has gone wrong, how you actually correct what has gone wrong, that, that will be different depending on the lab and depending on the physical system. But the detection part is kind of a universal process that can be applied no matter what your building blocks are for your quantum computer. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm interested in detecting these errors or in otherwise characterizing control errors. So there are certain, what I'll call desiderata, uh, that we'd like any characterization protocol to have. We would like it to be easy, fast, robust, and useful. And I'll explain what I mean by these words. Okay, easy, uh, well maybe that's self-explanatory, it should be able to be run in the lab with minimal effort. But this is actually kind of a high bar to get over because if you think about it, every single lab that is building a quantum computer, they already have some in-house method for calibration that they've been using and you know, it's probably been working pretty well because they're getting up to eight, 20 qubits, whatever. So it's, so far it's been working pretty well. So any new method that I devise, even if it's slightly better than the current method that the lab is using, if it's really hard to implement, like the, the cost benefit analysis is not going to make sense for an experimentalist to totally change the way that they're doing things for kind of a minimal benefit. 
But the easier I can make this protocol, the more likely an experimentalist will, will be to kind of take this and change their current setup and, and modify it. Uh, time is quantum money. The faster you can do these characterization and calibration procedures, the faster you can get onto the interesting work of doing quantum simulation or adiabatic optimization or whatever it is we are trying to do. And if you're having to do this, say, multiple times an hour or multiple times a day, you would like to spend as little time doing this calibration as possible. By robust, I mean that it should be accurate even under a lack of knowledge about other parts of the system. Like these experimental systems are very complex, they're very messy, it's just totally unreasonable to expect that we perfectly understand all parts of the system. So somehow we'd like to be able to calibrate very specific parts of the system, even if there are kind of tangential or related parts of the system that are causing errors that, that might affect what we're doing, we'd like to be able to get accurate knowledge about one thing, even if we have inaccurate or uncertainties about other parts of the system. And especially when we talk about robustness, uh, a term that comes up all the time is SPAM. Uh, and SPAM stands for State Preparation and Measurement Errors. And that's kind of a typical of this extra kind of uncertainty in the system. Generally, we're interested in characterizing the gates and gate errors, but often there are errors associated with the state preparation and the measurement that we don't know about, but somehow we'd like to still be able to characterize what happens with the gate, even if we don't exactly know what these errors are that are occurring in the SPAM. But the robustness can be more general than SPAM. You can be robust to all sorts of different uncertainties throughout your experiment. Uh, and finally, it should be useful for this calibration process. For me, calibration means figuring out what's gone wrong with your control error and then fixing it. If you're characterizing something that doesn't actually tell you about your control error, then it's not actually useful to fix that error. Maybe you learn something about whether you have an error or not, but I'm not interested in whether an error has occurred or not. I'm interested in actually fixing the error. So that information that I get out should be useful to try and fix the error. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is give you a kind of a rundown of the landscape of different characterization protocols and where they fall in terms of these criterion. Okay, so ad hoc methods, by this I mean kind of whatever is running in the experiment right now. Like the lab has been doing something for the past you know, three years to calibrate. Um, and what are they doing? Well, I don't know. It's probably something that a grad student like coded up five years ago and no one's really thought about since then. And the benefits of, of this characterization protocol are that it's easy. It's easy because, you know, it's already running and it's doing what it should be doing. And it's useful enough that, it, you know, ho well, however it's doing, it's, it seems to be doing a pretty good job. But probably there hasn't been a lot of thought into whether it's the fastest method possible or it's the mo most robust method possible. The textbook approach to characterizing errors and detecting errors is uh, quantum process tomography. And I would say this is a really relatively easy method to implement in that like, I mean, if you read Nielsen and Chuang, you can kind of pretty quickly understand what's going on. It's kind of easy to, to get, go from measurement to information about the errors. Um, it is, I put the useful kind of with a parentheses around it because what pro quantum process tomography allows you to do is to fully characterize everything about a gate error. But a lot of times that's almost too much information. When we're interested in fixing control errors, like experimentalists tend to have a couple of knobs that they can control. They can't control all, every single parameter. So we're especially interested in getting targeted information about the knobs that we actually can control, not about every single possible knob that we can't control. So this is almost too much information to make it, it's like overkill. And also quantum process tomography is neither fast and it's very not robust. Okay, randomized benchmarking is a procedure that has kind of taken the, the experimental world by storm in the last five to 10 years. Um, it was really exciting because it's a, it's a robust protocol, so it's robust to these spam errors that I was talking about. It's also very easy to implement. It's quite fast. Um, if you don't know what randomized benchmarking is, it's not that important, um, but the, the key thing that is important about it is that it's not useful for this problem of calibration. It's not useful because the end result, the, the thing that you get out of randomized benchmarking 
is an average fidelity. It just basically tells you how bad your gate is, but it tells you no information about in what way is your gate bad. So in terms of being able to use that information to fix the gate, it's totally unhelpful. OK, gate set tomography is a protocol that has been really developed by the folks at Sandia. Um, and it is robust, which is great. Uh, but it is not so great on some of the other uh, things that we'd like it to be. So I put easy and useful kind of in parentheses. So this protocol is easy in the sense that you can outsource this whole protocol to Sandia. <laughs> Um, so you tell Sandia some, a couple things about your system, and they tell you what data to take. You send them the data after you've taken it, and they analyze it. So that's great. That's like a, a very low overhead for you as a lab to figure out. Um, although there's this huge black box, which is Sandia, so you have to really trust <laughs> Sandia, maybe trust Robin in particular, which, you know, anyway. Um, and then at the end of the day, what do you get back? Um, at least the last time I checked, you get back like how many pages? 20 pages worth of uh, material about your system. It's HTML now. It's HTML, OK. Um, but some large website about your gates. Uh, and then if you just want to know, how should I turn knob B? Should I turn it to the right or to the left? It's going to take you a while to kind of sort through this and figure out uh, what information do I really need to quickly calibrate my gates. It is also very not fast. It seems. You know, for two qubits, you'd have to be taking, for a two qubit gate, you'd have to be taking data for quite a long time. Uh, so in terms of having a, a fast calibration procedure where you're detecting errors, trying to fix them, uh, seeing if you fix them, then maybe fix, trying to kind of do this back and forth with detecting and fixing errors, it's just not feasible for that kind of use. OK, um, so sexy adaptive machine learning strategy. I'm not thinking about any, like, one particular strategy, but I think the field, like, there, there, people are coming out with these new ideas for all sorts of procedures that sound really exciting, but then if you actually talk to an experimentalist about implementing it, like I dare you to talk to an experimentalist and tell them that you have this really awesome adaptive method and see how far their eyes like shoot out of their foreheads because um, you know, doing some of these things are just not practical to do in the lab. So even though these, these new procedures are, can be fast, robust, and useful, they're just too complex. There's too much of a barrier to entry and experimentalists often won't be excited about doing that. OK, so the answer, what I'm going to be telling you about today, uh, is the protocol that I've been working on, robust phase estimation. And of course, it checks all the boxes. What do you know? <laughs> it really does. OK, um, so let me, I'll go through each one. So it's, it's very easy for experimentalists to implement. The type of Experiments that you need to take to do this procedure are basically identical to Robbie, Ra Robbie or Ramsey sequences that the lab is probably doing already. Like the lab is probably already doing these sequences in their ad hoc method. So I'm just going to have you do the same sequences, but kind of analyze them in a slightly different way and hopefully take way less of them than you're already taking because my goal is to do this fast. It's also non adaptive, it's simple to analyze. You don't need to send tons of data out to Sandia. You can write like a couple of lines of code and analyze it yourself and feel confident that you know what's going on and there's no, there's no mystery involved. Uh, it's fast, so this, the scaling of, of how quickly you can learn uh, parameters is, it's, has Heisenberg scaling, which basically means optimal scaling. Uh, so it's within a, a constant factor of the kind of absolute best you could possibly do. It's also robust to spam errors, as long as those spam errors are not too large, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but it's, actually, it's not just robust to spam errors, it's robust to errors in any part of the system. And I'll also get to that later, too. So I said, you know, ideally, we would want something that can give you an accurate picture, even if there's a lot of uncertainty in all other parts of the system, and this procedure has that. And finally, it's useful in that it directly learns the parameters that experimentalists tend to have control over. So experimentalists tend to have control over, say, under and over rotations of the gates and some other parameters. And these tend to be the parameters that this protocol can uh, detect. So the, the types of errors that experimentalists can actually fix, robust phase estimation can actually detect and give experimentalists information on how to exactly how to fix those errors. OK. Um, so. 
I've been singing the praises of this protocol and I've been saying it's so easy, it's so easy. So if it's so easy, I should be able to explain it to everyone in this room in the next you know, five to 10 minutes uh, without it being, you know, hopefully everyone in the room will understand what's going on by the end of this. Okay, so let's, let's talk about characterizing a single qubit, say over rotation or under rotation. So a single qubit gate, we can model it as a rotation on the block sphere. So it's defined by an axis of rotation and an angle of rotation. So let's just assume we don't know, we wanna know how much are we rotating. We're concerned that we might be rotating too much or we might be rotating too li little. So we'd like to learn this unknown parameter theta. Okay, so we're gonna work up to the full characterization procedure, but the first thing I'd like us to consider is what happens if we have a perfect experiment. So in a perfect experiment, my perfect experiment, is we have perfect state preparation, we have perfect measurement, and we know everything about this gate, we know it's a perfect rotation, we know it's axis of rotation, the only thing we don't know about it is this angle theta. Okay, well, in this kind of idealized setup, what you can imagine doing, you can kind of, you can choose your state preparation and your measurement such that by doing this, the outcome, you have a two outcome measurement and the probability that you get outcome zero is theta over two pi, and the probability that you get outcome one is one minus theta over two pi. So you just repeat this experiment many times, and okay, you wouldn't get Heisenberg scaling, you'd get standard quantum limit scaling, but at least this type of experiment you could perfectly learn, get an unbiased estimate of theta. Um, and here throughout, I'm gonna be kind of ignoring, there are lots of mod two pi's floating around that I'm gonna be ignoring. Okay, but let's make this a little bit less perfect. In any realistic ex experiment, we're not gonna have perfect state preparation and measurement. We're going to have these state preparation and measurement errors. So you can imagine this as some unknown operation that occurs right after state preparation and right before measurement that kind of mess things up. And now when we try and do, run the same experiment, what happens, we end up with a bias. So instead of getting probability of one, or probability of zero being exactly theta, we're now shifted by some unknown amount delta. And that unknown amount is basically comes from our, our lack of knowledge about what's happening with the spam. And this is a very realistic kind of situation in, in the lab. Okay, so the basic solution is we're going to, instead of just applying the gate once, we'll apply it k times in between state preparation and measurement. And now, we're still imagining that it's a, it's a perfect rotation. So if we have this rotation that was originally theta, and now we, we're just repeating it k times, this is the same as doing one rotation by k theta. So in this case, the probability that we get outcome zero is now just k theta, but again with some bias, because there's, you know, the, the spam is still there, it's still acting. And now, the bias might depend on the number of times we've applied the gate as well. Okay, but that's it. These are the experiments that, we're, that you need to run to do this robust phase estimation. You need to prepare a state, apply the gate many times, and then measure. So how do we use these types of experiments to figure out what theta is? So we're gonna do a series of these experiments and I'm gonna track our knowledge of, or our estimate of theta over time. So I'm gonna put it on this uh, unit circle so the, imagine that the true theta is where that arrow is pointing. And the first experiment that you should do for robust phase estimation is the kind of standard uh, apply the gate once and measure. And this, we said, has a, a bias of delta. So if you were to repeat this experiment a couple, some number of times, you would get an estimate of theta plus delta. So let's put that up on the unit circle. And it's not gonna be close to theta, it's not gonna be close to the true theta, it's gonna be off because of our bias. Okay, but what we're gonna use this initial estimate for is to restrict our future estimates. So we're gonna say based on this initial estimate, we know it's off by a little bit because we know that there was bias in our estimate, but we don't think it was so far off. Like we know we have errors, but we don't think that they're catastrophic errors. So what we're, all we're gonna say is from now on, we think that the true value of theta is kind of not on the opposite side of the circle. Okay, then we run the experiment with two repetitions of the gate, and this will get us an estimate of two theta plus delta, plus some bias, and then when we divide this by two, and then because of the kind of modular arithmetic that's involved, we end up getting, there are two values of theta that are consistent with the data from this 
two rotation experiment, but only one of those estimates will be consistent with our kind of prior restriction to only one half of the unit circle. So whichever one will be allowed, one will be not allowed, so we're going to take whichever one was allowed and use that as our new estimate for what theta is. But the nice thing here is that the amount of bias has gotten divided by two. So the error has now effectively gotten a bit smaller, so our estimate should be a bit better, assuming that the bias is not increasing. Okay, so then based on that, uh, based on this two rotation uh, data, we're now going to restrict again, and we're going to say that um, we're going to kind of narrow things again by a factor of two centered around our new estimate, and we're going to say from now on we don't think the true value of theta is in this blacked out region. Next, we go up to four rotations and do the same thing. We're, there'll be four values on this unit circle that are consistent with the data from this experiment, but only one of them will be consistent with the kind of region that we've blocked off based on our previous estimates. So every time you just divide the kind of allowed region by two and update your new best estimate based on uh, your new data, which will always be biased, but you get increasingly better and better estimates as you go to longer and longer sequences. Okay, so this is the whole procedure. You run the experiment with k increasing by powers of two, and you end up with an error that scales like one over two to the n, where two to the n is the largest k that you run. And the one kind of trick that I haven't really discussed is how many times you need to repeat the experiment so that you make sure that the true theta is in the correct region. Um, because just because of probability, probabilistic region, reasons, it could end up kind of in the wrong you could end up in the disallowed region, so you need to make sure you take enough to not have that happen with very low probability. Okay, and so if we look at the, how efficient this procedure is, one way to measure the efficiency of this procedure is to think about the number of applications of the gate and uh, the error that you, in your final estimate. So in this case, we, if you have the correct um, kind of measurement schedule, with C applications of the gate, you can get error that's proportional to one over C, and this is also known as Heisenberg scaling. So this is as efficient as you could possibly be. We are using the gate as few times as possible to get as accurate an estimate of the rotation as possible. But we don't have, it's very simple compared to lots of other situations where you talk about Heisenberg scaling. Uh, often when people talk about Heisenberg scaling, they have to talk about entanglement or adaptive measurements or Bayesian updates. We don't use any of that. It's a deterministic, very simple, straightforward, single qubit procedure, although it can be scaled up to multi qubits. Okay, and it's also exceedingly robust. I've talked about that delta error, that bias is being caused by unknown spam error, but if you noticed in this whole analysis, we never said, oh, this delta, this error, this bias is coming from spam. It actually could have come from anything. It could have come from some dephasing noise. It could have come from non-Markovian noise. We, we were totally agnostic as to where that bias came from. We just said as long as, there's, as long as that bias is not like catastrophic, we're okay. So it's robust to all sorts of uncertainties in the system. But of course, this is assuming that that bias does not become catastrophic. And so what does it mean to be, have a catastrophic bias? Basically the bias must be less than pi over uh, four, which is actually quite large. That's a pretty huge bias. And that's definitely reasonable for spam. For some of those other bias, uh, sources of bias that I mentioned, like uh, non-Markovian errors or dephasing errors, depolarizing errors, those types of errors, as you apply longer and longer sequences, the bias tends to increase with the length of the sequence. So in that case, you would expect that if you have a very long sequence, things get so messed up that you're no longer kind of in this nice regime. The bias gets kind of overwhelms things. But in that case, the, the estimate that you get will be accurate up until that point and then it will just no longer be accurate. So the, the precision will be good until the delta errors kind of overwhelm you. And as the, as the delta gets larger and larger, you need to take more and more samples to ensure that you kind of stay in the, in the correct region. Okay, so, um, but, so I've talked a bit about the theory, but you know, like I said, I really would, these, these procedures are only useful if they kind of are good enough that um, in, in practice, in experiment, and if they're kind of easy enough that experimentalists want to use them and think that they're easy enough and better enough than whatever they're doing. Uh, so with Sandia, we took some 
uh, experimental data of this procedure. And what this is trying to show you is that we do see that Heisenberg scaling. So these lines are what we would expect, or the dotted lines are what we would expect from kind of Heisenberg-like scaling um, in our estimate, where the error is decreasing as the number of operations increases. Also, we compared to gate set tomography, which was the, the Sandia outsourced procedure, which I said was not very efficient. And so this is showing that if you want to get the same accuracy from robust phase estimation, the blue dots, uh, versus gate set tomography, the, the green dots, you can take many fewer samples. So to get you know, 10 to the third error in your estimate, you can take you know, orders of magnitude fewer samples using robust phase estimation than gate set tomography. Um, and I will also say that there are several labs that you know, did, started implementing this procedure, not, not because they were hoping to get like, a publication out of it, just because they found that it was better than what they were doing and simple enough to implement. So I think for me that was like, the, the real proof that this was uh, a worthwhile procedure. Let's see, how am I doing on time? Plenty of time. Okay, so there are maybe a couple of things that I've uh, kind of slipped under the rug that I will uh, mention. Okay, so I said that you need to have, like your state preparation and measurement needs to be relatively close to the ideal. Okay, so what is the ideal state preparation and measurement? If our gate is a rotation about the block sphere, we can imagine the plane that's kind of perpendicular to that axis of rotation. And then we can imagine two states that are orthogonal and both lie in that axis, so we'll call one alpha and one beta. And essentially, the state preparation that you should ideally be shooting for is to get close to that alpha and that beta. So I've been saying that you just need to do one sequence of, uh, like basically one measurement for each k. It turns out you actually need to do two. So the, the idea is you do one sequence of a given length k where you prepare in the state alpha, and one where you prepare in the state beta. And again, these don't have to be exact because we can tolerate errors in our state preparation and measurement, but you just want to be as close as possible because the smaller, your, your del the smaller the bias in your measurement, or the smaller the bias in your outcome, the few measurements you have, fewer measurements you have to take. So you should prepare in alpha and beta, and then you want to measure in the alpha, alpha perp basis. And then what this has actually asks you to do is, so I said you, in all these experiments, I said you could just learn theta plus delta. It turns out actually what you learn is cosine of k theta plus a bias, and then the beta experiments allow you to learn sine of k theta plus a bias. But with these two experiments, you just, these two allow you to learn k theta. So it's very slightly more complicated than the, the very simple picture that I was painting. But now I've really told you almost everything. The only thing I haven't told you is how many times you need to repeat each of these measurements to be confident that you're getting an accurate picture. And that is a formula that you can look up in the paper if you're interested. Um, so I won't go into that, but hopefully at this point, like this is everything. I've told you the whole procedure. I've told you how to analyze it. So you could probably go home and code it up if you were interested or start in implementing it in your lab. I'd love to hear if you do. OK, uh, so there are lots of future directions that I'm hoping to pursue. Um, so I'm currently working on how to expand this to multi-cubic gates. It seems so far to be very straightforward, uh, but we're kind of working on some of the details of that. Um, I think it could also be useful, like this is a very targeted kind of procedure, and it could be useful for targeting non-coherent errors as well. So it'd be great if no matter what type of error you're looking to characterize, you could have a very targeted method to do that instead of having to do something like gate set tomography to learn about non-coherent errors. And again, this kind of in line with that, this procedure might also be able to be used to characterize things like spam errors or some of these other kind of peripheral errors that are affecting our rotation because once we know kind of what's going on with our rotation, we might be able to back out what was going wrong with our spam or what was going wrong with other parts of our system. And that is everything. I would love to take questions. So thank you very much. Um, questions? Yeah, one right here. OK, so you may have said this, but maybe I missed it. Um, but if, the, if there's some uncertainty in the rotation axis itself, mm -hmm. 
um, is this, does this end up being, it seems like then you might be correcting uh, for the wrong rotation. So if, so if it's just a fixed rotation axis, we can kind of actually push that into spam because it's almost like instead of uh, aligning our alpha and beta in the correct plane, we're doing it a little bit off. Sure. But then the spam, th th that doesn't add up over time. That's just a fixed bias. So it's not, that, that type of error basically falls into spam error and can be accounted for with that. It's not something that builds up over time. On the other hand, if you have kind of a wobble, so if it's not fixed, I mean, that might contribute to, then you wouldn't, kind of at some point you wouldn't be, at, you wouldn't be able to get it super accurate, I would think. Like you'd be able to get it accurate up to the wobble, but maybe not beyond that. Mm -hmm. Okay, further questions? Um, oh, right at the back there, yeah. It's not turned on, I don't think. No. It's still not on. Yell. Yeah. You're saying what, where the, I'm, your, your question was what are the barriers to going to multi-qubits? Yes. As far as we know, there don't really seem to be any. We're just kind of more interested in what are the interesting, what, are, what I'm more interested in this point are what are the knobs that people have for two qubit gates and how can we directly target those knobs? So that, that involves some amount of figuring out like, well, what state do you want to prepare in? Which one of those knobs can we most easily target? Can we target all of them? Those are the more interesting questions. I think there, there aren't really any barriers to almost immediately extending this. Okay, so another, another question at the back right. Oh, um, oh Mick, okay. Oh, oh sorry, Rob. Yeah. All right, so uh, in the nature of a, a public service announcement, the black box is wide open. You can download PigSty yourself, and hit install PigSty, and it even does robust base estimation. Built in, open source. Okay, now, my question. That is true. That is all true. It is not a black box. I take it back. I mean, it might be a black box. You can have it on your computer. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so one of the things, I mean, GST has some significant similarities. These, these repetitions of germs mean that, to some degree, what we're doing is a much more arduous, multi-parameter, non-commutative base estimation. And one of the things that seems to be a real problem for GST is when the phase angles actually change during the experiment. So this is a form of time dependence or non marginality that essentially we get locked into a particular belief about what theta is, and then it changes for the second half of the experiment. Do you have any experience for how RPE behaves when theta is drifting? I mean, I think the advantage of RPE is that it's so fast that you could run it multiple times and try to get a sense for the time scale on which theta is shifting, and then that might, you could maybe interleave GST with this additional information and perhaps use that to update your models as you're running a more complex system, because uh, as a more, a more complex protocol that is so much more time consuming, because this can potentially, this is basically as fast as you can hope to get, you can at least try and get as much information about that time varying nature directly. But if you were to, if it's time varying on the scale of robust phase estimation, you're going to run into the same issues that you have. It's not immune to those issues. Okay, another question up, right up the, well, okay, yes. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's the thing that kind of kills us in the end because that those types of errors build up and build up and build up and cause larger and larger and larger biases in like basically larger and larger delta errors and eventually they, they become so catastrophic that they cause us to kind of 
you know, in our exclu we basically exclude where truth, the truth data is in our kind of con continually having an excluding region. So yeah, there's kind of no way around that, but at, w at the point that you're getting to such large sequence lengths that things are catastrophic, like at that point, you're, you're not gonna be running, you know, a, a computation that is that long anyway. So I mean, we can kind of, you can get accuracy up to the level at which you would probably be interested in running a computation. But that, yeah, we don't really have a solution. That's a, that's a problem. Okay, there's a question right at the back, yeah. yeah. No, at the very back wall, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, well, so you can still learn about the phase, but your accuracy will be, you can only learn it to the accuracy of the other errors in the system. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, are there any other, other questions? So, good, let's thank Shelby again.